KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. Please stay tuned for Terra Verde. The Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Howdy and welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environment affairs show. I'm your host, Jason Mark. Last month, Friends of the Earth released a report showing that nano-engineered ingredients are showing up in baby formula, unlabeled and untested. What exactly is nanotechnology? Why is it ending up in so many of our consumer products, from cosmetics to skincare to including now some food products? And what are the potential impacts on human health and the planet? On today's show, we'll be talking about that and other issues with Ian Illuminato. He's the health and environment campaigners with Friends of the Earth. And with J.D. Hansen, uh, the policy director of the International Center for Technology Assessment. Ian and J.D., welcome to Terry Verde. Oh. Uh, hi, Jason. Thanks for having us. Fantastic. Glad you're here. Um, Ian, let's start with you. And I guess a basic question. What exactly is nanotechnology? Because it's, it's not just right, it's not just a single technology, but rather a, a range of technologies. That's right. It's quite broad. Um, we're talking about engineering at the nanoscale. And the nanoscale is measured in nanometers. Um, So one nanometer is one billionth of a meter. And a way you can think about it um, is if you think of one nanometer is to a tennis ball what a tennis ball is to the Earth. Or if you imagine yourself as a nanoparticle, a human red blood cell would be about four miles long. So really small stuff. And uh, what scientists have found is the most properties of materials change significantly at that scale. So even color, for example, if you take gold and um, engineer it down to the nanoscale, it'll look a red-purple type color. It can be more reactive. Um, a lot of times these materials can be more reactive and a lot more mobile in our bodies because they're so small. And at the same time, these new properties that are um, being offered is why, you know, in most instances, companies want to use them in their products. Simply because they react so differently. One of the things that I found fascinating, one of the friends of the fact sheets I, I saw on this topic, was that when you get to such a small level, I mean, we're talking the molecular level, actually the, the physical properties, classical physics sort of gives way to quantum mechanics. I mean, these things uh, react in totally different ways than, say, a, a microscopic element. That's exactly right. A lot of them are affected by quantum mechanics, um, and that's an area that I find really fascinating, especially the theories. You know, you can have one particle in two places at once, which is kind of mind-blowing and really shows that the world is not always what it seems, and there's lots of, lots of mystery about, uh, you know, what takes place. And at the same time, companies have taken a small amount of that power and are putting um, these ingredients into products with very little knowledge about their safety and really what their appropriate use should be. And we're concerned especially that um, there hasn't been enough debate about what are appropriate uses for this technology because there will be some. Um, but at the same time, without any laws or labeling in place, consumers and even our government are left in the dark. So, J.D. Hansen, let's talk about what some of those uh, applications are. What kind of applications are we seeing already on the market, already out at at stores that include nanoparticles? Well, there are um, uh, many, uh, and uh, probably just in the area of nano silver alone, we identified over 400 products that we have asked the Environmental Protection Agency to take off the market because they haven't approved them. Uh, you know, it's, it's somewhat scary that of those 400 and some products, uh, nearly 90 are things that are going into food, and that's just the nano silver and uh, other products. Um, uh, titanium dioxide is used in everything from the paint on your wall 
to um, uh, your M and M's, um, and you know we shouldn't have hundreds of uh, these products out there. Um, there may be reason to use a a few of them, but uh, most of them are unapproved, and uh, some of them like titanium dioxide and the uh, 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 products that in, that Ian and Friends of the Earth have found in in infant formula um, uh, might well cause uh, cancer in the infants eating them. Uh, we'll come back to the infant formula later, which is the the main topic of today's show. But JD, I am hoping you can kind of uh, so 400 uh, products on the market. You mentioned M and M's. You mentioned yes. paint. What would be some of the other ones that that folks that common commonly use things? When you go to the when you go to uh, your um, uh, hardware store and uh, get uh, lumber that's been treated. That's treated with nano copper now, almost exclusively. Um, so um, uh, when you go and buy a new tire uh, that uh, likely has uh, uh, carbon nanotubes put into it, when you buy a new tennis racket, it has carbon nanotubes in it. There, there are a lot of products out there. Um, we're most worried. Uh, about ones that uh, go into food or ones like uh, carbon nanotubes that are known to be uh, very cancerous like asbestos. So you talked about ones that are going into food. What are the food applications? What exactly would they be used for? Well, in um, the nano silver is being used as a uh, antimicrobial in, in food. Um, uh, nano titanium dioxide is basically being used just to make it uh, uh, shinier, uh, which is a pretty frivolous use. I see. So, uh, Ian, Ian Illuminato with Friends of the Earth, um, you know, we didn't get somebody from the industry on this show, but what would the industry say? I mean, what are the potential benefits? What are the potential applications that these could be used for that perhaps would have a public good? Well, I think it depends. If you ask industry, especially the food industry, about their use of these ingredients in food, they'd most likely tell you they're not using them. And, in fact, a lot of companies uh, would prefer not to disclose their use of nanomaterials because they know it's a potential um, it's you know, a potential issue with consumers. Um, in terms of some of the positives, you know, I've, I've heard all sorts of things and I've written reports on various aspects of the technology. Um, you can use, for example, carbon nanotubes to make stronger uh, wind turbines and you can use them to make supercapacitors or batteries that are used in hybrid vehicles. Um, but even in those instances, we're not really talking about the energy and the chemicals and water that are required to make those carbon nanotubes. So to produce one kilo of carbon nanotubes that can go into some of these products um, requires a significant amount of energy, um, and there's been calculations made that show it could be anywhere from 150 to 300 times uh, more intensive than smelting aluminum. So that's some of the information that we're not talking about um, which really doesn't doesn't give the big picture of what it takes to get that end product. And especially um, one of the big concerns is also recycling. Where do these materials go? Uh, where do they end up? What is their fate? And we really don't know. So in a sense, um, you know, that's, that's similar to nuclear in the sense where we don't know how to recycle it. It can be very powerful. It can be useful. But at the same time, if we're not doing that other part of the work, which is understanding more about these materials, um, then we're headed in a direction um, that really doesn't, doesn't allow for us to take advantage of the full potential of this new scientific knowledge. Right, sort of the, the sort of classic technologist or technophilia idea that sort of asks whether, w if we can, instead of whether we should, um, you know, the, the idea let's if, let's let's test out our technology and see if it's possible before asking whether in fact it's a good idea. Um, 
J.D. Hansen, your organization, the International Center for Technology Assessment, I understand that you, you all sued the federal government, sued the Food and Drug Administration a number of years ago about releasing um, uh, products onto the market before being, in your view, adequately tested. So what were some of your concerns around public health? You mentioned cancer earlier, but what could be other possible health impacts? Well, the the big challenge is that uh, you can also have um, uh, reproductive uh, harm, um, uh, basically uh, uh, you could have uh, uh, these chemicals make uh, mutations in the in the fetus that would uh, give uh, lifelong um, uh, birth defects. Um, you could um, you could have problems with your immune system uh, because these chemicals uh, can disrupt the, the uh, microorganisms in your gut. Uh, all of these things need to be tested and tested well before these products are put on the market. Uh, the good news is that the Food and Drug Administration, because of our lawsuit, agreed that they would not anymore consider these products to be generally regarded as safe and that they would uh, require higher levels of uh, uh, testing and data um, from the companies that want to get them approved. And are they, in fact, now doing that? Um, yes and no. I mean... Uh, the you know the fact that uh, that uh, Ian's organization Friends of the Earth found uh, uh, this uh, a new uh, kind of uh, unapproved uh, nano product in infant formula suggests that the uh, that the FDA is not doing its job. So how exactly? I just kind of walk me through it. Walk the listeners through it. How is it possible that? these products would get on the market without approval. I mean, it seems like this new technology has slipped through something of a regulatory hole. Well, um, what the companies would say is that they approved them themselves. Uh, generally regarded as safe is a an awful uh, process that lets uh, companies do their own testing, uh, select their own labs to do the testing, and t then tell the Food and Drug Administration that it's safe. Uh, we've also sued uh, the, the FDA on how they've done generally regarded as safe, and they're required by court order to redo their regulations, and uh, we'll be looking at that at the end of, uh, end of July. That they're required to redo the regulations and release new regulations at the end of next month? Yes. It's good to hear. Um, Ian Illuminato, so walk us through, if you can, um, I guess my first question is, in your new report, why did you test baby formula? Was there something that you had already led you to believe there might be nanoparticles in infant formula? Um, well, a lot of our research was based on claims that companies had made about using nano, which were um, very sparse. So a lot of our past information, we couldn't really pinpoint exactly where it was being used. So um, several years ago, we decided to approach testing, um, which was really cutting edge, and many said it would be impossible to do this. Um, but, yeah, as I was walking down um, the grocery store aisle and picking out products, uh, this was one of them that comes in a white powdered form, and I thought that it would be a good candidate um, perhaps to test. And we tested six of the largest baby formula brands in the country, including Gerber, Enfamil, Well Beginnings, um, Similac, and we found that all six of those formulas tested contained nanoparticles. Your friends either tested them yourselves or you had them done by an outside lab? We had it done by an outside lab. It's a world-class lab at Arizona State University led by Paul Westerhoff. Um, so we worked with them to build the methodologies um, and really, you know, figure out how we could detect nanomaterials in the formula. 
Um, and then it took a lot of time to understand what we were looking at because a lot of medical professionals and other academics um, we discussed the project with really had no idea what we were looking at for a long time uh, because of the limited amount of information and disclosure uh, that is offered by companies. That's Ian Illuminato. He is the health and environment campaigner for Friends of the Earth. We're talking today about nanoparticles, especially nanoparticles that have been found in infant formula, according to a recent report by Friends of the Earth. Also joining us today is J.D. Hansen. He's the policy director at the International Center for Technology and Assessment. I'm your host, Jason Mark. So, Ian, um, tell us what exactly you found in those in those six brands. I mean, what, what were some of the nanoparticles that, that you identified? Well, we found nanohydroxyapatite in needle form, and I'd like to focus on that ingredient since I think it's of most concern. We also found uh, nanotitanium dioxide, which JD talked about, as well as uh, nanosilicon. Um, but what's interesting about the nanohydroxyapatite, if you look at the images in our report, the electron microscopy images, you'll see they're shaped very sharply like uh, little daggers, and they're very, very, very tiny. Um, so all of the manufacturer safety data sheets that I reviewed um, listed the ingredient as a potential inhalation hazard, and we have to remember that these formulas are in powdered form. So as they're being mixed, um, children and caregivers, parents, are being exposed to those materials. Um, the other um, scientific information that we have on this was produced by the European Union Scientific Committee on Consumer Safety, um, and they were actually reviewing this ingredient while we were putting the report together. And I'll just read their words directly. They say the available information indicates that nanohydroxyapatite in needle form is of concern in relation to potential toxicity, Therefore, needle-shaped nanohydroxyapatite should not be used in cosmetic products. Um, I don't think they were aware that it's being used in baby formula. They're charged with reviewing cosmetic products, but obviously something that shouldn't be used in cosmetics um, really shouldn't be used in, in an infant formula. I, I'm curious, is that needle shape? I mean, is that is that a deliberate engineering? Does that somehow increase the effectiveness or the potency of... Uh, you know, of the formula, or is that an accident? Um, I don't believe it's an accident. Uh, we're not exactly sure what the use is until we hear back from companies. We've tried to approach them several times. Um, but we know that it's either uh, a way to deliver additional calcium to the baby formula or as a stabilizer for the mixture, um, so another food additive. Um, because there is hydroxyapatite that's also in a more spherical form, um, and we found some of that as well, but um, most of the formulas contain this needle-like form, which is engineered specifically, um, and a lot of the science that I reviewed talked about its use in bone surgeries um, and dental surgeries. So that's why to a lot of professionals, they were really surprised and thought, this seems odd, um, and perhaps this is misplaced. And I think we've we've had agreement even from um, stakeholders who usually aren't on our side with the issue um, that this, in fact, is an example of something that is perhaps misplaced and really needs to be looked at by the FDA and removed from products while we realize, um, while we do more research and understand if it is, in fact, safe and appropriate. Because really, in essence, I mean, the take-home message is simple. A product that's fed to millions of infants um, shouldn't be permitted to go to market if we're not sure it's safe. So you mentioned that nanohydroxyapatite, I want to make sure I got that correct, it's quite a mouthful, that nanohydroxyapatite would be a, a risk if inhaled. Of course, this product is meant to be ingested. Uh, it's an infant formula. So when ingested, is the concern that these needle-like nanoparticles would somehow, I don't know, penetrate a cell wall or, or, or would end up places in an infant's body where it shouldn't be? Exactly. That's exactly it. So there's the inhalation potential exposure when um, parents are opening this up and mixing the formula. But then when the formula is in the body, these particles, uh, we're not sure exactly where they go. We do know from um, the EU Scientific Committee, which is a very rigorous committee that um, informs regulators in the European Union, and in fact they're making this ingredient illegal in those cosmetic products, um, but of course, According to the science that they've collected, 
this little nanoparticle can actually approach a cell and be absorbed by a cell, um, and they can affect the um, they can even affect our DNA uh, because they're actually so small that they basically meet, and then from there we know very little. Um, so it's not just an inhalation hazard, but it's also a hazard because it's so small and it becomes bioavailable, which means it can get to parts of the body that other materials can't. And we have very formidable barriers in our body, and nanomaterials have been shown to be able to actually cross those barriers, like the blood-brain barrier. Essentially, it becomes a genetic risk, potentially. Potentially, yes, and we've also seen, as, as JD has mentioned, that these can be, um, you know, lodged in placenta. They can end up in fetuses, um, and you know, any any type of matter uh, in that very sensitive area can be an issue. So I'm curious. You released this report last month. You briefly mentioned that you tried to contact the six manufacturers or marketers of these products what if anything did you hear back from companies like gerber like enfamil uh like similac unfortunately we haven't heard anything and we did approach them before the release of the report um with the information and wanted to give them the opportunity to learn more because they may not be aware that this is in their products companies that are that big use third-party suppliers um to provide ingredients for their products um, so this may not be advertised to them in the same light that we're proposing it um, so they they may have no idea now they should know because we've attempted to contact them multiple times we also have a petition online that's available at fo um, foe dot org slash nanotechnology and we've collected 30,000 um, petition signatures so far to get the companies to respond, um, remove these products, and also work with us on how they can put together policies that protect consumers and their own interests at the end of the day from these ingredients, uh, which are currently not governed by any laws. I guess I'm surprised to hear you say, you know, not governed by any laws, especially when I think about infant formula. You know, uh, some listeners might remember the, the, the scandals of the late 70s and, 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 and 1980s when um, some of the large manufacturers of infant formula were supplying less than nutritious infant formula, especially to poor nations, nations in, in Africa and the developing world. So isn't infant formula among the, the more closely regulated food products? I mean, how did this one slip through? You would think, um, but when I actually went in and reviewed what the FDA requires for infant formulas, they only require that um, they only do screening for pathogens, um, and they require the formula meets certain nutritional requirements. Uh, but that's about it, and they don't screen for these new synthetic ingredients. They don't screen for synthetic ingredients at all, um, and so it's it's not very robust, and that's very surprising because you would think that all of our resources would be invested in taking care of children, really, um, that that would be the priority, that anything you feed a child um, has to be safe. And I think we have the we have the resources and the capabilities to do that. Um, there's just not a strong mandate, and that's why we're trying to get this information out to the public so people can really um, request that there is a debate and that there is some justice in this area. So J.D. Hansen uh, from the International Center for Technology Assessment, un under the uh, agreement, I guess the court order that 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 you have with the FDA, with the new rules that are supposed to be in place. Next month, would they have prevented this kind of situation from happening? Well, they they could because uh, we think, uh, you know, or we at least hope those new rules will make it clear that you can't have sweetheart deals uh, with uh, your reviewers, that you can't use the same reviewers all the time. Uh, you know, there is a huge difference in the uh, number of approved food additives in the United States versus Europe. Europe has 2,600 approved food additives. We don't really know how many approved food additives we have because companies can self-approve, but the estimate is around 13,000, which means we have 10,000 more food additives than Europe has. Or six times as many. Clearly a big difference there. So I'm curious what each of your organizations 
think should happen regarding this this new and it seems largely uh, un- untested technology. Uh, J.D. Hansen, what is your organization's recommendation for policymakers? What what do you think should should be our 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 policy regarding nanotechnologies? Well, first. Um, uh, we argue that you should take a precautionary approach and that if you don't have data uh, you're, about the safety of your product, it shouldn't be on the market. And that the FDA, the EPA, the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, needs to exclude from the market uh, anything that has not had adequate testing. Um, and yet, would that would that would that then involve removing some products from the market? I mean, in a way, it seems like the har- the horse is is kind of out of, already out of the barn when you mentioned there's 400 products on the market. Well, you know, to its credit, the um, uh, both the, you know to their credit, both the Consumer Product Safety Commission and the um, uh, EPA have ordered the removal of products from the market. And have uh, issued big fines uh, on, on companies that have products out there that uh, are unproven and are making health claims that are also unproven. Ian Illuminato from Friends of the Earth, what exactly is your organization's hope or or recommendation of policymakers regarding these technologies, these nanoparticles? Well, I think it's very similar to uh, what J.D. was was talking about. Um, I also think that even just in terms of efficiency and really taking advantage of the investment we've made into this technology, uh, we need to really give FDA uh, the resources to be able to, to investigate um, and really use their authority to make sure that we're only putting safe products on the market. And our government invests at least a a billion and a half dollars a year, excuse me, in nanotechnology research um, and development. So a lot of that money does need to go towards understanding health effects. And we didn't really discuss them today, but there's a lot of potential environmental concerns with these materials getting into the environment. Well, what would those be? We've got a couple minutes left. What would what would what would be those uh, environmental concerns? Uh, well, for example, the titanium dioxide we talked about that's also used in sunscreen. So when folks put that sunscreen on and then they go bathe um, or even take a shower, that ends up in wastewater and in marine environments, um, and they've been shown to be able to kill uh, really important nutrients for marine life, um, and that's just one example. Then uh, J.D. also talked about nanosilver, and nanosilver is a really potent antimicrobial, and we know that silver um, doesn't really do well in water, um, and especially with marine organisms. Um, so that in terms of other environmental effects, I think, you know, there's really loads of research that show when you're when you're tampering with nature and you're putting stuff out there, you need to be really sure that um, that you have the knowledge necessary to make sure that you're not um, really disrupting what is a very delicate balance uh, that we are still learning about. I'm curious, you know, just about 30 seconds, which is all the time we've got left. What about labeling? I mean, do, do these, do these uh, particles currently have to be disclosed on packaging at all? Not at all. Yeah, so I think that's that's a really basic right, and especially here in in America, um, that's a right that consumers have really demanded to to know what they're buying and what they're ingesting. Um, so that's where the justice piece comes in. Uh, the companies really do need to disclose that they're using these new ingredients. Um, and on that note, that's all the time we've got for today's show. I really want to thank Ian Illuminato from Friends of the Earth. I want to thank J.D. Hansen from the International Center for Technology Assessment. To learn more about Friends of the Earth, new report on nanotechnologies and baby formula, check out foe.org. Many thanks to Lucretia Burton, our engineer. Hope you have a great weekend. This show and others available online all the time at kpfa.org. Have a great weekend. Negin Farsad is the young female Iranian-American comedian who wrote and starred in the hit documentary The Muslims Are Coming. Now she has written How to Make White People Laugh, a candid, incisive, humorous stand and a stand-up 
against racism and stereotyping. Negin Farsad will perform How to Make White People Laugh at a KPFA benefit Thursday evening, June 16th at 7.30 p.m. at Oakland's First Congregational Church, 2501 Harrison Street. There is free parking and wheelchair access. This is Malihera Zazan, co-host of Voices of the Middle East and North Africa, inviting you to join Negin and me. Tickets are available online at brownpapertickets.com and at our supportive bookstores for Negin Farsat on June 16th. <laughs> 